You know, I think you, it's interesting. You learn a lot of things uh, coming to a conference like this and um, the, the discussion of the Tax Act, uh, Tax Cut and Job Creation Act. Uh, it's very, very interesting. But the fact that Mary buys three sizes of shoes and sends two or three back is, is giving me some insight into how the retail business works. So uh, I'd, I'd like to talk about multifamily. Um, on the multifamily business, you know, I've been with a group of people who have been investing in multifamily in the U.S. for 25 years. Um, coming to Germany to talk about multifamily, I was interested to see how the, uh, the sector would be treated at the, at the front end. And it was, uh, it was nice to hear James listed it as one of the darlings, along with logistics. Uh, Frank talked about uh, multifamily, but in his chart on flows, he had retail, logistics, and office, no multifamily. And, and so there's a little bit of that um, you know, understanding of where multifamily sits in the U.S. So I'd like to start off with it's a core sector. It's been a core sector for 30 years or so. And we look at the U.S. today, we have favorable demand drivers, and, and we talk about millennials, and I'll talk about millennials a little bit later, um, strong demographic and econ economic trends. But as a core sector, these next three bullets Right. High long-term uh, historical occupancies, low historical capex reinvestment, and strong relative liquidity. So three really strong factors on core core product. How do you define core product? Thought it was interesting. Joe had in his slide capital reinvestment, that capex reinvestment at over 50% for office. Multifamily, it's the lowest capex reinvestment. I think on NACREF, it's about 24%. Uh, so when we think about you know, what multifamily does, it's an income producing uh, sector, income producing asset, it's a distribution asset, and that CapEx is, is part of that. Down at the bottom here, this is that uh, wheel, is transaction activity, so sales uh, from 2012 through 2016. That four year period, you'll see that apartments were 33%. They were the biggest transaction, biggest volume generator in, in the U.S., followed closely by office, then retail and, um, and logistics. Again, it's a core product, highly liquid. Um, it's very diverse as well. It's interesting. We've, we've, uh, we've heard that, that, that uh, multifamily is just not that traditional uh, apartment housing, it is student housing, it's senior housing, there's luxury housing, workforce housing. And when we think about the investment in multifamily, we do think diversification is, is how you should look at the U.S. when you think of housing and multifamily housing. So about a third of the U.S., uh, a little bit more, 37% of U.S. households are renter households. Um, in the middle, you'll see that household incomes are fairly evenly divided between low income, moderate income, and, and higher income households. So it's not, um, you know, it doesn't fall into one category. This is rental housing. It's across the, uh, the income, income levels. And then on, on housing stock, um, interesting point is about 50% of that stock is 1980 or newer, which means that you have A and B product uh, about 50% of that stock. Now we get into the 1980s, a lot of that stock is perhaps um, going to be repositioned, moved back up. We, we call it restore to core, uh, but, it, but it's a very deep housing stock when you think about what you could invest in from an institutional perspective. On the demand side, and I think the story when going forward is about demand, and it's in, driven in part by millennials, um, but we think about what, what, drives, what drives demand? Starts with jobs, job creation, moves to household formation, household formation drives housing demand, and then as you see, as we'll talk about this cohort, uh, rental housing is a big component of that housing demand. So we, we look back here, okay, the, the GFC, of course, job loss, but what we've had since, call it 2012 forward, is two million jobs a year being created in the U.S. and uh, about a about a million eight, I guess, is where you'd say is the break-even point for um, for the growth in in uh, in our in our supply of workforce. So we have been in in that de uh, declining unemployment rate you know, going on for five or six years now, and the forecast is we're going to stay at that level, two million plus jobs on an annual basis. 
What that did for household formations is exactly what you'd expect. Um, GFC occurs, nobody has a job, particularly young people. Unemployment uh, for, for young graduates coming out of college was very, very uh, high unemployment. So as soon as we started to recover jobs, another two years later, we started to generate households, and we're, we're on a very, very long stream. As a matter of fact, if you look at, at this period here, this is the longest uh, continuous job growth we've had in the U.S. Um, since 1940. So uh, very, very good period. Look out at the forecast household formations. Long-term average, 1.2 million. Uh, we're forecasting 1.5 to 1.6 million over the next several years. Again, very, very high demand for housing going forward. Um, however, there's a supply side issue, and you've, you've, you've heard a lot about multifamily in the U.S. being oversupplied, and that chart on the right, is, it talks to that issue. Um, so strong rent growth, multifamily led the recovery out of the GFC for, for sector. It was, uh, had the highest occupancies. It, it had rent growth before the other sectors. And if you're, you're placing capital, where do you go? You go to multifamily. That's what happened. And, and eventually, you had, you, you've had what we have right now, which is an oversupply over a long period of time. But if we look at the previous dozen years or so, it was an undersupply of multifamily. So we do have a, a bit of a catch up that's going on, and we look at where we are today, uh, we have a little bit of a moderating of, of uh, vacancy and rent growth, but we're still very positive in, in both, those, both those areas. Um, and then you'll see a very f uh, significant fall off on the, on the supply side. And some of that is government regulation, oversight onto, onto lending, and some of that is in uh, competition for the trades. Yeah, you'll also hear in the U.S. there's um, infrastructure, and President Trump is is looking to to um, grow the inf infrastructure, repair the infrastructure of the U.S. And as a trade, where, where do you go? Do you go to housing or do you go to government spending? Government spending is where the money is. So you will see a, a fall off there. And then finally, um, what we've seen is the supply has been luxury supply, and it's been in the top ten markets. Uh, one, of, one of the speakers earlier talked about that flight to quality following, following the GFC. It's exactly what happened on the supply side, too. Go to the urban centers, top 10 markets, right, luxury product. So that's, that's where, and when, when you look at the U.S., that's where there's some softness. What it has done, however, is opened up an opportunity on the B side. This is a forecast of axiometrics um, data. It's a five-year look forward. And this is a, the, the dots are the top 50 uh, markets in the U.S. And you can see the U.S. in the, in the middle. Over the next five years, it's somewhere between 25 and 3% rent growth and just under 95% occupancy. That, that's a very, very healthy outlook. Then you look at the preponderance of dots in the middle, you see really a 3% th rent growth and 95% or higher occupancy. Very, very stable. Again, income producing, even with a supply side, this is the, the five-year forecast. So w on the demand side, what, what's going on? Uh, uh, we'll start in the top right chart, right, the U U.S. home ownership. Back under the uh, President Bush administration, there was a push for home ownership. And so you'll, you'll see in 2004, we peaked at uh, over 69% home ownership. And, and the thought behind that was, if you look at statistics, neighborhoods that are, have single family ownership, they're safer, uh, people reinvest in, in their housing, there's, there's higher retail, there's more stability in the jobs. So the thought process is, we need to have more homeowners because we're gonna get that result. The fallacy in that argument was, we, we, we got to a point where there was no skin in the game. There was no skin in the game for the, for the buyer. There was no skin in the game for the lender because they were backed up by the federal government, by Fannie and Freddie. And so what we had is we had subprime lending. We had defaults. We had people moving out, um, moving out of their homes and declining home ownership. Right? That, some, some would say that was a catalyst of the GFC. What we've had is this declining home ownership uh, for the past call it 12 years since the, since the GFC. That's a big boom for, uh, for the multifamily side. Now on the top left, average student loan debt. 
And you'll see over a seven year period, there's been about a 50% increase in the average student loan debt. So this gets back to the millennials. Uh, millennials see a decreasing home ownership, they have increasing debt, and, and, they're, and they're mobile, right? They're, they're looking, where, where's Amazon's next move? I, I heard it's in Atlanta. Um, <laughs> But, but that's what they're looking at, right? What, what, do I put my money down and say, here's, here's where I'm going to be, uh, or do I stay flexible, right? right? Flexible housing. Down the lower left here, this is the average household assets by age. So under 35, that total nest egg is about $50,000. If you think about an average home in the U.S., it's between two hundred dollars and $300,000. I think the average down payment required by a lender today is 20%. That means you have to have fifty to $60,000 to put a down payment on to start a mortgage. That's a big decision when all the money you have is $50,000 and maybe you owe $30,000 in, in debt. And then over in the lower right, um, 25 to 44-year-olds, propensity to rent going forward at over 50%, which is really really an amazing stat when you think about our historical um, average rent, renter pool being, uh, you know, 33, 34, 35, 36%, 55% of those going forward are going to be renters. Uh, this is just a little bit of a top down from research, how we look at, at things, how our research department looks at things. Four categories, labor markets, which is employment growth, unemployment, commercial real estate fundamentals, vacancy and rent growth, capital markets, interest rates and risk appetite for investors, and then finally debt availability, debt for investment, debt for development. On the employment and uh, uh, growth and unemployment, very shiny, right? We, we, as I said, two million jobs, longest period of, uh, of employment growth in, in 80 years. Unemployment rate, we are at full employment at 4%, 4.1% unemployment. That means there is wage pressure. That's a good thing, good thing for housing, ability for household formations, ability for people to, to uh, rent. Down in the uh, commercial real estate, vacancy and rent growth, a little bit cloudy, and that, that's a bit of the supply catching up. So when I think about today, 2018, I think there's a little bit of volatility that's in 2018. I think about a little bit longer term, multifamilies in a very, very good space. Capital markets, interest rates, and, and investor risk, uh, partly sunny. Uh, we do have volatility in, in, um, in the S&P, even though we've, we've hit the, the highest point ever just a couple of months ago. There is a, some volatility, the new uh, Tax Cut and Job Act. Now, now if you're going to call something, right, Tax Cut and Job Creation Act, right, well, that's the way to do it. Um, you don't say, let's make rich people richer, act, right? You say... Tax Cut and Job Act, right? That, that's, it just sells well. So I think that that is a, a very positive uh, for capital markets. And then in, on the debt availability, there's plenty of debt for stabilized properties, income-producing income properties, and there's a pullback on availability of debt for development. So I think for existing uh, multifamily, that's a very positive. Uh, we tend to, to look at, at the U.S., um, multifamily market as, uh, as hitting middle America, right? So you'll hear a lot about, if you read about housing today in, in the U.S., it's housing affordability is a crisis. And so how do we take care of middle America? And so we think about investing in multifamily, the hub is, is hitting that demand, that component of middle America, and how do you provide housing for middle America? And regardless of where we are in the cycle, that demand stays pretty constant. Um, and I'll, uh, next chart, I'll, I'll show a little bit of, of where I see mi middle America um, occurring. And then outside the wheel, based on the economic cycle, there are different strategies that complement that middle America housing. And so we, we would say we're still in that expanding market, maybe a little bit on, uh, you know, toward the, the 12 o'clock hour, right? A little bit mature, uh, but still seasoned core and restored core. Uh, if we, we do think there's an extended period that we're on, but if we do hit a declining market at some point in the future, student housing, senior housing, workforce housing, you think about student housing when, when the economy's down, students go up, right? An alternative to work is education. Uh, seniors, you can't get rid of them, right? They're going to have to live someplace. 
Um, yeah, I guess we're going to live in Sears, I think is what Mary was saying, that uh, an old Sears out in, in, before it becomes an avocado ranch. And, uh, and then workforce housing. I mean, that, that is the staple of America, right? It's blue-collar jobs um, that, you know, before we become tech, tech giants, um, we, work, we work workforce housing. And then ultimately, um, this, is, this is a little bit of ways away, but that development and, and luxury will come back. So finally, this is a, it's a little bit of a look at where middle America is. And, and this is, uh, again, axiometrics data. It's across the US. And to give you a little bit, this is, these are all average numbers. So at the top of the chart, $1,700 is the average rent achieved on new construction. So I, I do say, if you're in New York City, it's going to be a lot more. If you're in Kansas City, it's going to be a little bit less. But if you take the whole country, and on average, that's where the new rents are. If we look down at the bottom here, that's the Class B rent. So across the country, again, the average rent for Class B product is $1,200. And then right here in the middle, that's the average rent of an average household. That's, that's the amount of rent. It's 30% of your income, right? It's a rule of thumb in the U.S. that you can pay for rent. So basically, it says the average household can pay $1,400. So if you're meeting middle America, you've got to provide housing that can, can meet that, that, uh, that group, that group of people. What we've done on the supply side is we've fed the top because it's hard to develop for uh, the middle, middle America. Just, the, the cost structure just isn't there. So we, we've, that's where the oversupply is. Here's where the opportunity lies, right? The Class B product, and this is kind of the strategy you've you've heard from probably a number of uh, of advisors, right? Buy the Class B and move it up to provide high level housing for medium income, middle America, medical middle America demand. And when, when we look at this, we say, okay, this is older product. We can we can upgrade some of that product, put the stuff that uh, is in the new, right? Put the kitchens, the countertops, the lighting, the plumbing fixtures that are in the new product and, and do it at an affordable rate so that we can, we can satisfy middle America. So a quick math, if you got $1,200 rents and you can go to $1,400 is what, what the, the market will, will take. If you put $10,000 in into a unit with new appliances, flooring, countertops, plumbing fixtures, lighting, That'll get you about $10,000 plus or minus. If you can get $150 a month in rent, that'll get you to $1,350. That's $1,800 a, a year. It's an 18% return on cost on your $10,000. Puts you at rent at $1,350 below the median income for the, the area. You're, you fit that bill. So that, that's why when we look at, at housing, rental housing in the U.S., that's the hub. If we can fill that hub, constant demand, right, constant demand, and, and as we look forward, right, more and more demand for rental housing, and then how do we complement that on the outside? 